to be able to see you too. Thank you. John McLaughlin. Walt You're welcome, Gray. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Nice to see you. May I call you John during this interview? Uh, <laughs> that's my name. Well, all right. I'm going to call you Gray if that is all right with you. <laughs> that's just fine. I appreciate it. Well, I'm honored uh, to spend some time with you and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity to Great. speak about what I do. Yes. Well, thank you. You know, I've been a fan for a very long time. And the first time I saw you was the Mahavishnu Orchestra at the Beacon Theater in 1971. And you, wow. shared, and you shared the bill with one of your heroes, Cannibal Adderley, at that time. I remember that gig. Oh, yeah. Oh, you... What a thrill that was to see Cannibal. Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember his reaction to your music that at that time? Uh, well, no, I that I didn't see, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he if he was um, surprised himself. Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, and no, I know. I mean, there was a, there was a lot of there was so much reaction. Some of some. Uh, Fortunately, uh, majority of it was very positive, but there was there was uh, kind of a, quite a bit of negative feedback from the kind of classical jazz community. But since uh, I'd already experienced that with with Tony Williams and Lifetime, um, you know, we uh, that was a, that was a radical band too, very radical. Do you recall that trio, Lifetime, with with Khalid Yassin, Larry Young on organ? Oh yes, absolutely. And I was very curious. Tony Williams has played a big part in your life and your career, hasn't he? Very much so. I mean, I had Tony. He's on the 1965 recording of Miles in Europe. Mm -hmm. Recorded just down the coast from from me, the Juan Lipan Festival, oh. which I would have played this year, uh -huh. with, would have been my first gig. Oh. Um, yeah, because it's about forty five minutes drive from here, mm -hmm. and uh, but the, there's a there's a wind called the Mistral that blows that blows in from the west, mm -hmm. and it was it was blowing. We went on the stage for the sound check. It was about. Uh, uh, 50 kilometers an hour. I don't know. That's like 30, 30, 35 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, 20 minutes into the sound check, there were gusts going up to 65 kilometers an hour, which is, I don't know, 45, 45, something like that. I mean, yes. fast. Yes. Uh, and, and strong. And, and the, you know, the, they've got really big speakers that are hanging, the hanging speakers, you know, because it's, it's in the open air, mm -hmm. right, next to, right next to the beach. And these big speakers were swaying backwards and forwards. And, and you know, and the production said, hey, everybody off, that's it, canceled. The whole night was canceled, which is a shame. Oh. So, um, but he's on that album. I'm sure you know that album, Miles in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I heard that. I mean, and Tony. I mean, Miles. He's been my hero since I'm 15. But to hear Tony, um, what the, he was just revolutionary for me. He was fantastic because I heard first time I heard I heard Miles was Philly Joe Jones on drums, mm -hmm. and then um, um, who was it uh, playing on the Kind of Blue album? In terms uh, of you mean Jimmy Cobb or uh... yeah, Jimmy Cobb, mm -hmm. you know, who who was beautiful. They're all fantastic, both of them fantastic drummers, very different. Yes. But Tony came in and Tony was making Miles play just uh, marvelous. I mean, he was Miles was soaring with Tony. And uh, and well, when I finally got to meet Miles, it was because Tony was leaving Miles and Miles wasn't happy about that. Because my love Tony, everybody loved Tony. He was he was amazing, but that lifetime was radical. Yes, because I remember. Uh, I mean, we playing slugs. Slugs was a club in 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 the East Village, in the Lower East Village, uh, which was and we you know where you do four one hour sets a night. This is this is where you get your chops together, Gray. Mm -hmm. And I remember some you know jazz people coming in and the. 
and they're looking at us askance, if I can use that word, like, <laughs> what are they doing? <laughs> you know, what, what is this band doing? And, uh, but, you know, it was a time of, of uh, exploration and, and just, uh, you know, breaking free from, from uh, you know, what's being done. I mean, this was, this was one of the reasons Miles, uh, Miles hired me because he wanted a guitar player and he wanted to break out of, I mean, he must have had the most perfect quintet of the 60s wasn't it? I mean, actually from, from the late fifties. Yes. And, and he was ready to, he was ready. I mean, the times were changing. They were changing as Dylan was saying. Mm -hmm. And, and Miles was very much aware of that, you know, and like with, he moved with me first in the, in a silent way. And then really big time with Bitches Brew, mm -hmm. but a uh, lifetime continued uh, for two years and it was really uh, Tony as you say was a critical element in my life uh, because first of all he was the one that invited me to New York so without Tony's invitation I would have never met Miles and I, I would never have played with Miles so I have a big debt to him. Can you put into words how his playing affected your playing? Yeah, because Tony, uh, Tony, you know, drummers typically <laughs> less now because there's so much evolution happened mm -hmm. in the last, gee, what's that, 50 years, isn't it? 69, 70. Um, the drummers would, would uh, play with the with the idea of coming out, the phrasing would come out on the one, which, which is nice and that's important. Mm -hmm. But Tony phrases and his accompaniment were, um, were, were much freer and they would come out on the two and or something like this, yeah. you know, just, but in function with, you know, rel relative to who, who was playing and what was being played. So uh, Tony was was uh, was an agent provocateur, as they say. He, but this is something that I personally want from a, from a musician. I need to be provoked. Uh, not it's not a, generally provoked is negative, but in this sense is most definitely positive. Yeah. And he he provoked Miles. I mean, to play those the last five years of the of the nineteen sixties, Miles was he was playing like a soaring eagle. It was unbelievable, amazing, and that was Tony. And 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 so for me to get the chance to play with Tony and then with Miles, I mean, Incredible. how lucky can you get? You said uh, I've heard uh, an interview with you. You said that Miles knew what he didn't want rather than what he did want. Do you approach your music in the same way? And, and what is your creative process? Oh, yeah. Nice. What is the creative process? Uh huh. That's a good one. That's a good one. Um, those, I mean, when, when you go back to 1969, 1970, mm -hmm. um, you know, there was this move out of this straight ahead classical jazz because because the the influences i mean take my case in particular the 1960s you know i'm i am by discipline of love a jazz musician mm -hmm. but in the 1960s you know there's no way i i could make a living playing jazz impossible really mm -hmm. um I, I would get maybe one jazz gig a month uh, something like that, and 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 even that that was it was for a mere pittance, you know. I mean, there was there was no money, so I I was playing most of the time in the sixties rhythm and blues, because R and B was in the clubs. This this you know, Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames, even Graham Bond uh, and the Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce. We were playing uh, more jazz, but still very strong rhythm and blues influence, mm. um, which which I love because anyway, you listen to to to, to Mingus, some of the albums from Mingus, I mean that blues and roots, that's R and B for me in a way. 
Of course, you know, you got people like Eric Dolphy, Ted Kurson playing with Danny Richmond, this they're great jazz musicians. But uh, Mingus had this this tremendous love for 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 for, for jazz, but for, for blues and for R and B, and so it was all it was all a packet, really. It was all part of, in a way, Black American music, mm -hmm. which is what uh, you know uh, I loved most of all. It's why I became a jazz musician because of my my love of that music. Mm -hmm. um, and so by the end of the '60s. You know, you've had a decade where, where Miles with his amazing quintet, Coltrane doing amazing things. Um, in particular, uh, well, let's, I mean, let's go back a little further. I mean, albums like Giant Steps, I mean, these, these were milestones in jazz. He was setting the bar for jazz musicians. He was setting the bar for himself. And then, you know, on the other albums, Africa Brass, these great albums from Coltrane, then comes Love Supreme, which really blew my mind completely. Uh, it took me, a, took me about a year to figure out what the music was all about, but it was all about the poem that was on the back cover of the, of the vinyl album, you know. I've been meaning- and, uh, Yeah, tell well me. Well, it was just, I, I remember this quote, you talking about it and saying that you listened to it for a year and got it. What was it? I want to know what you mean by you got it. What was it? Uh, and well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you fall in love, Gray, and you don't need anybody to tell you, do you? There you go. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you turn the light on, the uh -huh. light is on, you know, okay. before it was off. And it's, it's as simple hurt. as that, because after a year of listening to that album, suddenly the switch went on you know i think if you persevere enough with anything you'll get it you know hmm. and i i had to get that because because i was taken so much by the poem because a lot of us were already looking for answers to the great questions of existence at that time and coltrane was not only just one of the greatest musicians but he was he was such a, a light hmm. in in in, in the, not in the darkness, but in the light in the world, because he was such a strong spiritual love he had. He had, you know, the God or whatever, the, the, the universe, the Supreme Spirit, uh, mankind, the whole, everything's involved in that love supreme. And that was a tremendous uh, 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 impact yeah. it had on me. And I had to get, I had to understand, not understand, it's the wrong word. I had to get the light to turn on because in a way, it's really hard to talk about music, isn't it? Yes. I mean, you know, the music of the, and the spirit that's behind music and, and, and that album was so revolutionary. It took, well, you know, it's probably because I was a little stupid, Gray. You know, it took me a year just to list, just to hear it. Anyway, finally I did. And then, then the Beatles, and then you have James Brown, and you have these tremendous, because I was playing R&B and I was in funk bands too. Mm -hmm. And so all of these influences, they all, they all played a part in my education. Right. And then when I was, I became a studio shark, you know, I, I, I had to do some rock and roll. And so I don't like rock and roll as much as the next guy, as long as it's good rock and roll, you know, I mean, there's good and it's not so good. It's just because, you know, I, I can say quite categorically, there's some, what music people call jazz. And it's, for me, it's not jazz. It's, it's wallpaper. It, you know, it, it, there's no... There's no passion there, you know, and, and this is this is what I'm I'm looking for in the music. You know, jazz. I... This that was uh, no, please. Go that ahead. became you know that was when 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 it became uh, how should I say a marketing device? You know, smooth jazz and funky jazz and you know and and and, and some of it is great, but but when I compare that to to the albums of Miles and the, just the, the amazing passion of these recordings and and without for me that's but that's what I grew up with because even in R and B if there's no passion uh, I mean 
-hmm. Where is it? then what you, what's left? A lot of notes, really, yeah. isn't it? It is. I, I, going back to the creative process, though, for you, do you always approach it the same way? Do you have the timing, you, the off timing in mind already? Does that come after the music? Do you already know what you're going to create or does it happen in the moment? I'm just trying to get us what it's like for you when you create a tune. Um, well, the tune, the tune comes and tells me, it tells me what it, what it wants. Mm -hmm. And, and, and sometimes because the, the, the music really did cause the shots and <clears throat> Uh, let's just, for example, let's say this, this, this new album that, that I made called uh, Liberation Time. Um, <clears throat> that came out of, of about eight months of absolute frustration because everything I had, all my gigs, tours were canceled. And, and there was this, this desire for liberation. And you know, to make a long story short, uh, this, these feelings of, 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 of uh, being blocked and, and you know we're in quarantine we're in lockdown um they came out in 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 the music and the pieces of music they as soon as i i heard them uh, when i started to play them and, and, and get them coherent um i could see right away the 60s influence in these pieces <clears throat> not because i i'll say i'm going to write some kind of 60s influenced music. Uh, I'm not able to write like that. When it comes out, it could be it could, like the tune um, "Lockdown Blues." Mm -hmm. That's that's not straight ahead jazz. No. This this is this is kind of fusion R&B jazz, but but all put together with the, with the 4D band, and then we've got the, the 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 Indian drummer singing these rhythms, the conical. Yes. So the, the music really dictates where it's going to go, whether, whether it's going to be a fourth dimension or whether it's going to be a Shakti tune or whether it's going to be one of the tunes that happened on, on, the, on the Liberation Time recording. And the, all, all the pieces, without, with, with one exception, that the that, that tune, um, uh, lockdown blues. I needed acoustic bass mm -hmm. already. That that tells me something. It means that's that's going back to this period of nineteen sixties that was so informative for me. Mm -hmm. That and I hear the drum. The drum is going to be playing. He's not going to be playing funky drums. He's going to be he's going to be playing free because because I have for example. I get that. I get the piece. Let's take that piece uh, right here, right now, right on. Yes. I get the melody. I've got the melody. I hear, it, and it's, I hear it's, and I know it's got this joyful vibe to it, which I, I really like. And so, but I need. I want to. I want to have a saxophone player. So I, I asked this, this Julian Siegel, the, the player, and and so I'll make. A, I'll make. A, there's a score of the tune. With the, with the harmonic structure, what we're going to solo on. So, because I, I start off my my musical life as a pianist, Gray, mm -hmm. you know, I can I can I can set up a, a keyboard score, and all for the fourteen years, uh, almost the fourteen years I spent in New York, I had a drum kit at home because I love to play drums myself, even though I'm I'm a refugee at the drums, so. Uh, so, but I'm able to set up a session. So I've got the session, the tune, the structure. I'm, I'm much more in a way, I'm more like Wayne. Wayne Shorter, his tunes were really structured. They were, they were, they were you know, and beautifully lucid. That's what I loved about Wayne. Wayne and, and the impact Wayne had on Miles too was, was marvelous. So outside, I have the score. I make an MP3 <clears throat> and I've got the scores. I'll make a session, Logic or Pro Tools, and I'll send it. And the instructions are, you hear me playing the keyboards and you've got the score. Do not play what I'm playing. You play 
what you want to play on that structure. I don't want to hear me play. I, I hear me play all the time. I'm not even that good. So, but I want to hear you play because I want to feel your spirit and especially in the improvisations, be free. This album is about wanting to be liberated. Uh, you know, I know it sounds kind of uh, hyper, but it was most definitely the feeling that I had. And I wanted the, the, the musicians to feel free and to go for it because we're all, all the musicians, everyone that I speak to for the last 18, 20 months, we're all just like, anyway, briefly, they all are instructed. They have a structure, but I want them to be totally free. And I want to feel what they are at this time in the life, which is a very difficult time for musicians. So I want to, I said, just put it all in. If it's crazy, as long as it's you and it's it's really you, then that's what I want. So in you see both sides. I do. And in recording this, I'm assuming, I'd, I'd like to hear about the recording process. And I'm assuming you recorded things, sent it off and people did it, even though it's such a live feeling. And I'm curious, what is what was the process? And then did you change your playing or your attitude towards a song once getting somebody's material back to you? And the, yes. Oh. And not on everything, but but absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the key points, uh, Gray, is to try to get the bass player and the drummer to play together. Mm -hmm. This this if it's possible, this is really this is really important because they're 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 the heartbeat of the band. They are, you know, and we're we're yeah. just the icing on the cake, yeah. basically. The, the very first song on on the album, uh, as the spirit sings. The drumming, well, the drumming is great in the whole album, but the drumming in that song in particular is incredible. What did you, was he the next person to add something to yours? How did he, how did he make it sound? Or how did you both make it sound so live? Well, uh, that's Vinny, uh, you know, right. Vinny Colliuta, what can I say? He's, what, a, what a marvelous player. What a lovely player. What a musician. I mean, I've heard him in, in concert where, he just blew me away, just really blew me away because it's the, his solos, the way he plays, I mean, it's just marvelous. He's marvelous. We had a lot of, a lot of great experiences when, when uh, we were touring with Shake and Five Piece Band. Mm, remember that album? I I remember those, you know, those, uh, the tour, those tours. I think, uh, Brian, and, play, oh, go ahead, excuse me. But no, no, but, so, but we've, re we've not only have we played live before, we've recorded at a distance before because, uh, but we're going back to, ooh, that would be um, maybe industrial zen mm -hmm. or, or yeah, something around that time, which no. where, no, not industrial zen. A one? No. I forget, I forget the album, okay. but, but there's a tune, there's a tune called New Blues, Old Brews. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sorry, I, 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 I forget, I forget the, times, the, the album. Anyway, yeah. and, and so, and we don't, um, you know, we all, we've known each other for, for since, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And, 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 I, and, I, and I know what he felt about the Mahavishnu Orchestra. And this tune, this tune is right out of the Mahavish Lorcas songbook. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the piece, but oh. it is so weird. Uh, but, but weird in, in a nice way to me. And, and, and thankfully, uh, Vinny took it in that way. And he plays, mm -hmm. you know, he just listened to me play and he played with me. And it just, it's uh, so outrageous what yeah. he does. Wow. So, so I have this. So I have, I have a very close connection with Vinny, and and this this piece uh, I, I wanted I wanted him I wanted him on it, and and you know and he knows exactly what I what I mean when I say you know Vinny, be free, let the spirit take you, you know, because that's what I want. I I, I want, and that's that. I have to I have to just hark back to Miles here, because Miles. He, he, 
he always wanted his musicians to be themselves, to be absolutely them. He, he didn't like directing, uh, telling musicians how to play, which is why he always came up with these kind of Zen koans, you know, very mystical. You know, I mean, he was well known for that, how he would, you know, I mean, and I, I got that. Mm -hmm. uh, I got that from him, and I seen him do it with, with Wayne. I've seen him do it with Jack Jeanette, Jack D. Jeanette. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen him do it with Michael Henderson on on the bass. And uh, but it, it's always he has a way to say something that knocks your normality out of your mind. <laughs> and so what happens after after the statement? I mean, for example, the one with one with, with Jack, Jack Dijonet, we he stopped the session in the middle and, and he went over to Jack and he said, Jack, boom, 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 boom. okay. <laughs> so, you know, what are you gonna <laughs> what do you make of that? Nothing. You lose you, you lose, you say, what does it all mean? You don't know anymore. And so you come, you start playing with a very fresh mind. And he, Miles was a master of that. And so, and so, and I learned so much from him in, in those terms because he wanted his musicians to be free and to be passionate about what they're doing, but in the context of, of the Miles Davis quintet, you know, directions with Miles Davis. Yeah. But that left everybody with a lot of leeway. I'm great. I mean, just you, you listen to some of the, uh, the live albums, what Tony's doing, how Wayne is playing and, and, and Herbie. I mean, they're going sometimes so far out, but never too far out. Do you know what I mean? They're always just like, they're like, um, you know, tightrope walkers, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and in fact, that reminds me of, of somebody asked Wayne once, um, uh, definition of jazz, and and Wayne, Wayne says, "I dare you." Uh, you know? yeah. I also that's, like I also like that Miles a, Davis said that jazz. He defined jazz as social music. Social music. That's what he called. There it. you go. I want jazz. Wow. I didn't know that. No. That's far out. Good for him. Yes. Bravo. Social music. As a turnaround. Go ahead, excuse me, go ahead. No, 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 after you, sorry. Well, I was just gonna say, as a turnaround with that, if you had to describe fusion music, because your music is often described as that, what is fusion music? Well, I mean, you wanna go back to the 18th century and you'll hear, <laughs> well, well, you'll hear fusion, yeah. Mozart, um, who's in Austria, mm. and being heavily influenced by, the, by Monteverdi and the Italian composers. Mm -hmm. I mean, they all, they, we were, you know, and, and, and the impact Mozart had on Beethoven. What about the 18th century composers <laughs> who had, or 19th century composers who had on the early 20th century composers like Ravel, Scriabin, Debussy. Yeah. I mean, where this new, where actually jazz got its harmony from. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just fast forward a, a minute to uh, nine. 1958, Miles made an album with Gil Evans called Miles Ahead. And on that album is one of my all time favorite tracks. There's, there's a track called Blues for Pablo. And I think it's dedicated to Picasso. And this tune, because I just, just uh, as a side, when I was 14, I got, I, I got um, very heavily influenced by flamenco music. <clears throat> it's really before I got into jazz. Mm -hmm. I was very much, actually I wanted to be a flamenco guitar player, but in this little town where I lived way up in the Northeast of England, there, there nobody had ever heard of flamenco. So <clears throat> that was out, but the impact of flamenco was, was very strong, uh, which came later in, in my life with collaboration with Paco de Lucia. But this tune, Blues of Pablo, this is total fusion music, it's fusion jazz, because you hear the Hispanic influence. And not only that, the Hispanic, you hear 
the the impact, for example, of the you know the the other one has concerto from Rodrigo. Beautiful, and and Miles loved flamenco music. He loved the Hispanic side and the tone is totally fusion because it's this Hispanic music with jazz and with blues and it and it's but it's it's right. There's yeah. a rightness about it. I don't know the Zen people would call it suchness, if yeah. that makes sense to you, because you cannot define it. It's it's when you hear fusion music, either it's it's sounds artificial. Or it sounds right, and and hopefully uh, what we do is <laughs> it sounds right. I try to avoid artificiality, but um, that's the only definition I can I can put it, because even you have you have, uh, for example, that is Vinny himself made an album. Oh, we're going back about thirty years here, and 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 it's like. You hear a kind of rock Mahavishnu, but but the the tune itself is outrageous. It's it's great. It's just great because and it's and it's got the drums pounding away and the bass is there, and the guitars are screaming, but it's beautiful. And and why? Because it is beautiful, and it's as simple as that. Oh, if if it is if it's not beautiful, then it's, then it's, then. You wouldn't bother with it. You know, I don't know when people listen to music, uh, they know in an audience, an audience knows when it's happening, when it's not. And and you ask them, how do you know? And I'd like to know what answer they give you. Because that's that's really what it is. It's like, you know, the light goes on suddenly. It's like somebody in the band gets inspired, gets inspiration. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, the band knows it, and right away the audience knows it, and that's what they're waiting for, because that's what we're all waiting for in the end. But that is something that's out of control. We just have to be ready. That's all when it happens. Well, maybe this question ties into it too, which is my question that uh, before the 2017 tour with Jimmy Herring and the uh, Meet the Spirits tour, there was concern for arthritis in your. Yeah. Uh, the arthritis in your hands are concerned about. And in a recent interview, I heard you speak about your aligning yourself with the healing process. And now arthritis is not as much of a concern for you anymore. And that really speaks to the power of the mind. How does the power of the mind show up in your music? Um, well, I think the power of the mind, when it's, when it's in harmony with the heart, uh, is what you might call intent. And, and intent is probably the most powerful uh, thing a human being has. If the intent is stronger, but, but the intent is not just mental, it's emotional. And this, I think it's, a, it's this harmonization of, of both the mind and the heart. Let's see, are, are you? That's, that's, and that's, I mean, that's what I use to cure myself, you know, and I have to, I have to give credit to you know, uh, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who's, who's a doctor in America. And, and, and I've never, I, all I did was I, re, I read about him in his twenties. Uh, he loved to bike and, and he got knocked over by a car. It, it was in his mid twenties. And his back was broken in three places. And they said, you're going to be in a wheelchair the rest of your life. And he, and he said, I'm not. But, it, but he was in, in bed, he, out of action for over two years. But in those two years, he went inside his body and used what I can, I can only say is intent, very powerful intent. Yeah. But of a healing kind. I mean, because he speaks about how, because I did it and I do, I do it to this day. I started three years ago speaking to my hands every morning before my meditation. 
and I tell them how beautiful they are and how amazing and how grateful I am, what they've given me in my life, great. I can never, how can I ever thank them enough? They're marvelous. And, and three years ago, I stopped having injections in my hand because the swelling was going down on its own. And I, I called my doctor at one point and I said, I don't need to see you. And he said, cool, great, don't come, you know? And, and I haven't been back, That's so great. but I don't stop. The thing is now I, do, I talk to my whole body. Mm -hmm. Now it takes a longer time, but, but, but uh, what I, I've lost friends. I've lost a number of friends recently that, that really got me. Yeah. And, and I'm extremely fortunate to, to be still healthy at my tender age grade. You know, I'm going to hit 80 next year. You're looking I good. mean, that's, that mentally, that's a big thing. But, to, but in another sense, it's meaningless. What does it mean? Mm. It only means something if, if I'm sick or I'm old and I feel aged and I feel weak. Mm -hmm. And I don't. Mm -hmm. Musically, I've never felt better. Um, okay. I'm not able to play tennis anymore, but I don't have any pain. I don't have, I'm, I have, can play my guitar exactly what I, whatever my mind demands, I can go for it. I don't, I don't have any suffering. And I have, I, I suffered a lot from, because it hit me in the early 2014. That's seven years ago. And I had it for about three years. Yeah, so three, and a, three and a half years. And I was doing all kinds of different treatment mm -hmm. until. So I'm, I can testify, if you want, you know, on the holy book <laughs> that, that it works. That's Mind over matter. We can heal ourselves. <laughs> Absolutely. I am so glad to hear that. And I'm so glad to hear you're out of that kind of pain, too. Oh yeah, well, no, but, I mean, I thought it was over. Mm -hmm. I mean, my career, I really did, yeah. but it wasn't meant to be. I hope you're not suffering from anything, Gray. Yeah. Well, there's some art. Oh, you look good. I do, thank you, I'm doing well. Yeah, and I find music is extremely he healing too. It helps me get into a space that allows me to talk to my body. I yeah. Think. Yeah, very much. It definitely, it is. It's music heals, that's for sure. That's for sure. Let me ask you this question I ask everybody that I do an interview with, and it's always interesting to see the difference. When you're performing, what are you doing five minutes before you go on stage? And what are you doing five minutes after you're off stage? Um, five minutes before? Well, with the band, uh, we, just, we, just, we just hug each other mm -hmm. before we go on stage. Yeah, we just like give each other some big hugs, you know, because it's because we want we uh, I think you can go on stage and um, and really mess up, mm -hmm. you know. You, yeah, you can you, you can forget things, you can forget a structure, you can forget a melody, you can you can forget things, <clears throat> and. And you can you can lose your place in improvisation if you go so far out. Suddenly you, you have lost your place, and then and that's a disaster. Yes. But mm -hmm. the only thing that gets hurt is your ego. Is you know that's the only thing that's bruised. And 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 any we don't care because without risk, what is life without risk? Yeah. And especially what is improvised music without risk? Yeah. I mean. <laughs> you have you have to you have to take the risk. You have to jump off the deep end and hope you fly. <laughs> what are you doing five minutes afterwards when you're five off? minutes after this first five minutes and it's done. Uh, well, uh, we did, well we uh, we give a, we give each other a hug after too. A hugging. Yeah, yeah. We're we're into hugs. Hugs <laughs> hugs are good. good. Um, and then. Uh, I don't know if depending how I, I'm not, I don't get thirsty. I like to have some fresh fruit after I play because I don't know, I get, yeah. especially if I've been sweating a lot. I like to, you know, some, or an apple or just some, 
pineapple, something like that, or even juice. Just, uh -huh. I'll, I'll like that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what that's what I go for. Oh, that's great. Or if there's nothing, then just water. Mm -hmm. Good. One, one. Well, I could go for a beer also. Yeah. If there's a, if there's a cold beer. Yes, yeah, sure. I don't I don't drink. You know, we don't, none of us drink before going on stage anyway. Let me ask it's you. It's funny that one one glass of wine can really affect me. Uh huh. Yeah. It, it yeah. It takes the edge off. You know, of your mind. With and, alcohol. You edge. It's and you need weird. that edge. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask you something going back here. A, a tune, one of my favorite tunes, is uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Arjun's Bag. That then oh, yeah. follow <laughs> your heart. You recorded yeah. it three different times on Extrapolation, uh, My Goals Beyond, and with Joe Farrell. Yeah, with Joe Farrell. That, that was a real yeah. what a surprise. Because, yeah, I mean, I was just happy to be on the session with Joe. I'd seen him with Elvin mm -hmm. in, in London when they came to London. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, re I loved Joe. What a great player. And I was on the session all of a sudden out of the blue. He says, You got any tunes? You know, I said, yeah, I got one, but it's an 11. He said, that's cool. Let's hear it. <laughs> what was the inspiration for that song? Well, originally, mm -hmm. uh, I was playing in this. There was, yeah, I was with a, in 19, wow, 66, mm -hmm. 66. Uh, I was, I was playing, no, 67. I was playing much more in Europe, and it was with like a, it was a free jazz band. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, um, and the, the 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 leader was was a vibraphone player called Gunter Hampel, a German guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that free, you know, because I was listening a lot to to uh, Ferro Sanders, of course, because it was Coltrane introduced me to him, Archie Shep. Uh, in the band with Roswell Rod and Beaver Harris, um, Cecil Taylor, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, some of this, this, this stuff was really going, I mean, you listen to, to the later records of Coltrane, like Intergalactic Space and all, huh. I mean, the, this was the inspiration for a lot of European jazz, uh, free jazz groups. So um, the bass player was, was a, uh, was a Dutch guy, and he and he always had carried this bag around, uh, and but this bag would always be in some this some be somebody's foot. You know what I mean? Yes. And, and and the eleven for rhythm is is like you know you're dancing with a club foot. Oh. You know, <laughs> I yes. mean it's, it's really weird, but it's very enjoyable. That said, <laughs> it's very enjoyable, but the you know when I this rhythm came out of me with these chords, and and, and right away I thought, this 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 rhythm goes with this bag. I love that. <laughs> I love that. You know, it reminds me of Magorsky when he wrote pictures of an exhibition. He said, you know, the theme that ties the different pieces together, which is walking along the promenade, is off. Oh yes, very much so. It's off kilter because the painter he modeled that piece after had a limp, so that the piece has. <laughs> Slight <laughs> was from piece to piece, and it reminds oh, that's, me. that's cool. That, what a nice story! Yeah, I didn't know that. That's great, but I know I know the, the piece. The, yes, very nice actually, isn't it? It's yeah. a nice piece of it's a nice work. Will you play in America again? I don't know. I don't. I you know. I I just, I'm just especially these last two years where everything got cancelled. Yeah. I I. You know, I have one gig. I was supposed to have two gigs this year. Mm -hmm. You know, and and fifty percent of the tour got blown away with the, the Juan Lipin gig uh, because of the wind. And I had one gig in Switzerland. Two days, two days later, and that's it. That's all I've had this year. There may be, a, maybe I might have a gig uh, at the Monte Carlo Jazz Festival with Marcus Miller. Oh. I hope that happens. The thing is, is things are still changing every week. You know, I mean, just recently in Monte, in, in Monaco, Monte Carlo, we have to wear masks in the street again. 
Yeah. But we, you can go into the restaurant. So you can only go into the restaurant if you have a mask and if you have the the, the vaccination pass. You know, mm -hmm. you have to you have to show that. Once you sit at the table, you can take your mask off, which sounds crazy because the, although the the tables are farther apart than they used to be, yeah. but even so, you know now we ha we have to wear the mask in the street. I mean, it's we never know when it's gonna change. We don't know. Just recently, um, just recently, I heard that from the European Parliament that Americans may be subject to uh, quarantine conditions because of this, the so many red states where the, the COVID is, I mean, it's terrible numbers of, of new infections every day. It, this is very troubling. So. I don't know. I mean, I just heard about last week, I heard it on the radio, and, and I don't know whether it's come into force. So we just go from day to day, Gray, sure. or week to week, week to week maximum, because yeah. things can definitely change after a week. Yeah. So whether I will play there in, in America, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, at my age, I, I'm just taking it one day at a time. Um, I would just love to be able to play. Uh, but for the moment, I have an agent, and we have we have the European. We had a, a big European tour last year that all got blown out. We were supposed to go to Japan also at the end of the year that got blown out. Mm -hmm. And I have I have a spring European tour <clears throat> that that uh, my agent says uh, you know it looks good, but you know, that's what they said last year, wasn't it? Yeah, exactly. They said it's going to be fine next year, and it wasn't. Everything got just blown out. It's terrible. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, getting getting a work visa for the U.S. is is also it's oh. a Herculean task. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it requires. I have to fly to Paris to 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 go through two interviews. Where, where I'm asked, uh, why do I want to go to America? <laughs> and, 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 you know, and I, you know I have, I'm invited to go to play there, but, but they, they, uh, they, they, it's not easy. They don't make it easy. Sure. They don't make it easy. It's, they don't make it easy for anyone. You oh. know, I understand, I understand the philosophy, but at the same, I, it would, I mean, Americans can, walk into Europe and play and stay and you know it's it's, it's easy but unfortunately the, the reverse is not true I see um, it's a major hassle great it really is I didn't realize that I know but, um, you know we'll see yes it, it, you know the, the jury's out still thanks I, I know you have to go soon I have two quick quick geek questions about the new album uh, okay. The okay. tune right here, right now, right on is the only tune where you have a saxophonist, as you said before, Julian Siegel. It starts off with with um, a horn section, basically. And I was wondering, how did you make that horn section? It's like played like a horn section at the beginning. How did you create that sound? Was it just your guitar doubled over or keyboards, too? Uh, well, that's that's Oz Eseldine playing keyboards. Okay, he's a, he's amazing. Was it all he's, him that made that sound, or were you also putting your guitar in for the for the opening of the tune? Um, I think that's Oz. Yeah, okay. I'm just coming in with Julian. Okay, on the melody. Okay, so that's yeah, and he's he's amazing. We we we've, we've known each other for. for quite some time now, about four years, maybe five. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I got to hear him play, oh, oh a couple of years ago. And I thought, oh, I one day I have to I have to play with with Oz. Oh, he's, yeah. he's 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 yeah. wonderful. That's great. Well, that's wonderful player. Yeah. Yes, next. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> is um a liberation time the title cut itself. I must admit it brought back memories of me from the song uh, on the way home to earth. That's, that ends visions of the Emerald Beyond, and also yeah. phenomenon compulsion because it was just a blast of guitar. Did you record that in one take? And did you yes? Did you name it before you did it or after you did it? Did I what? Sorry. Did you name the song 
before you did it or after you did it and listened to it? Um, well, I knew that the, the, I, had, I had the title of the album in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I had, I had a feeling that this, this because this is, is, I'm sure you recognize the structure. Yes. It's, it's from Miles' So What, it's mm -hmm. from Coltrane's Impressions. Um, I mean, I don't know, a lot of Michael Brecker did a marvelous yes. version. You have two chords. But the thing is, if if you if you get enough inspiration, mm -hmm. you can you can this the sky's the limit. Yes, absolutely. On this tune, absolutely. the sky's the limit. But you have to you, you have to be moved by the spirit. That, yeah. that, that that's really the only criterion that you have. But um, playing with Gary, Gary. I mean, he plays keyboards in the in the band in the in four piece, uh, um, in, um, yeah, fourth dimension. Mm -hmm. But but he's an amazing drummer, and <clears throat> this was one take. Uh, I actually did it before he did his drums oh. because I set I set up I set up uh, the sequence and I set up some some strong drums so I, you know that would kick me along mm -hmm. um but oh yeah i, I want to come back to to the question you asked before which i didn't address was that sometimes the session would come back and 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 they taken it another level up and i had to redo my part Absolutely. oh yeah yeah mm -hmm. but the great thing about music is you know when you've got players like that on the on the track, you know you put the headphones on, mm -hmm. close your eyes, mm -hmm. and you're in the same room with them. You, they're not anywhere else except they're right here, right now. You know, I mean, it's it's it, this is the amazing thing about music. But that happened. They really, yeah, they blew me away, and I, <laughs> I had to redo it. <laughs> Well, that's great, isn't it? That makes it very yeah, fun. It, yeah, yeah. Oh, it was marvelous. Yeah. Absolutely, <laughs> that's great. I've heard rumors that there may be some new releases of the Montreux Jazz Festival coming out. Is that true? Yes, yeah, there is. There's a compilation coming out. Um, is it based on that 17 disc uh volume that you released many years ago? No, it's it's uh, I mean, you know, since we lost Claude Nobbs, the founder of the festival. Yes. Um, uh, new people have moved in, they've taken over, but uh, they, they're really trying to, to, to do something now with, with uh, the archives that, that Claude made over those years, mm -hmm. um, because their recordings of me going back to 1971 or up to the last time I played would be, yeah, 2017 or 2016. So, but um, that's, that's much too much music. Uh, so they made a selection of uh, a piece from, from the One Truth Band in 1978. Okay. There's a piece from the last edition of Mahavishnu Orchestra with Bill Evans on saxophone. Um, there's, there's there's music from the Heart of Things with Gary Thomas and uh, and uh, Admaro Ruiz on piano. That's that's what a great band that was. What a great band. Um, there's there's music from Paco and I when Paco and I did a European tour, just the two of us, and we made a stop in Montreux. And, and so there's there's music from that. There's music from, there's music from, oh yeah, the Free Spirits with Dennis and Joey Di oh, Francesco. Francesco, yes. Oh, and the, oh. I mean, oh. yeah, the, I mean, I had to use this music. Yeah, it's it's on the CD, but the, <clears throat> the compilation, basically we, they, they made mm -hmm. a selection and then I went back and I said, let's, let's so we refined it together, but, there's some great stuff on this album. Holy smoke! I mean, I I I was I had like 
but everything is hard. I can't just say this is like great and that's you know because it's all pretty amazing. So I'm very excited about a gray. I mean, it's a historical thing to yeah. me because there is there is one tune from from fourth dimension from 2016 where we're playing playing the homage to Paco. We're doing that uh, El Hombre Casabia. <clears throat> and <clears throat> but but um, I think I was uh, I was blue. I was blue in this recording mm. because I was thinking of Paco. I really miss I miss this guy so much. Mm. I mean, he's sixty six when we lost him. It's two thousand fourteen also. Mm. Anyway, um, but it's 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 great to hear it. And and the, the other stuff, I mean, I just uh, just it's marvelous. I think I think uh, you'll enjoy it. You yeah. know, I I certainly hope so. Yeah, I look forward. It's a kind of a big walk down memory lane, Gray. Yeah, that's been yeah. No, isn't it? Well, yeah, John, I really appreciate your time. You've given more than I even expected, and this has just been great. I feel like I could go on for hours, but I feel like I've taken up oh. your time. <laughs> oh, that's very sweet. Well, you know, I can hear dinner being get ready downstairs. Oh, yeah. so. <laughs> I just want to tell you that, um, just on a personal level, I'm just this fan that loves your music, but I am so glad, so grateful that I'm on the planet at the same time you are, so that I can hear your music fresh every time you come out with it. And I just thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. Oh, you, you're very kind, Gray. You're very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. For me too, and our listeners will love listening to this. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.